Welcome to the Accountants Exposed podcast, where we create light bulb moments for our listeners by exposing the journeys, secrets, and insights of some of the top players in accounting. This podcast is brought to you by Michael Edelstein, Director and Founder of Recruitment Expert, a specialist accounting recruitment agency working across Australia, New Zealand, and Asia Pacific. Ladies, gentlemen, and accountants, I had the pleasure of speaking with Michelle Nine on our podcast. She's a self-proclaimed millennial accountant, but the good type, of course. She's highly regarded as a young leader in finance. She's entrepreneurial, tax savvy, and a whiz when it comes to generating loads of leads through Instagram. We talk about all sorts of things, from her being in a cadet and accounting firm, to bodybuilding and having a successful side hustle whilst working in practice and doing her CA. But wait, there is more. We cover all things accounting, growing in client base remotely, leveraging offshore resources, using tech for efficiency gains, and of course, her specialty, lead generation through social media. So tune in and enjoy the podcast. Also, a little community announcement. Make sure you get your tickets to the County Expo in Darling Harbour, Sydney for the 28th and 29th of April, so you can get your dose of CPD hours, listen to amazing speakers over two days, and learn something new. And guess what? One of those speakers will be me. And... Another interesting thing, we are partnering up with the conference organizers, Terrapin, so we'll be covering the event through our podcast, and we'll add a link to the show notes, so please buy your tickets, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hi, Michelle. Welcome to the Accountants Exposed podcast, and thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. I noticed you started working in legal practice and continued there throughout your degree. What made you decide to study accounting instead of, say, law? Ah, okay. So, backstory, I started working in a family law firm while I was in high school, just doing some admin work after school. Um, When you say family law firm, like your family? No, no, just like family law, law in general. Okay. And then... I just kept working there as like the receptionist while doing my degree. So there was not really any, I suppose, wanting to go into family. I just happened to get this admin job and then that just sustained This was like your first high school job, basically. Uh, Oh, yeah. Well, second, I used to work in hospitality, but yeah, in a, um, yeah, I used to work in hospitality, but yeah, that kind of just kept me going um, because I always kind of wanted to be an accountant. Like I made that decision in high school did my degree, worked in admin, and then I think the admin experience helped me land my first job. Okay. How did you make a decision to become an accountant in high school? <sighs> I mean... It's like, I, it's like it's not a typical thing that a, a girl says, hey, I want to be an accountant when I grow up, unless there's a lot of like family pressure. Uh, if you talk to any <laughs> uh, mixed immigrant child, you know, I'm... I have an Asian mother. It, the op, the options are doctor, lawyer, engineer, accountant. <laughs> yes. So, um, not gonna lie, you do have like the pressure to pick one of those. Um, Mum was really pushing me to become a lawyer. <laughs> um, so, but I I naturally chose accounting probably because I really love businessy type stuff. Like in high school, I did like the accounting subjects, the business subjects. Like I don't know, I think I always had an interest in there, and then the natural progression to becoming an accountant. So there's no real exciting story as to why. I think they just liked it and pursued it. Okay. Why didn't you go and do like I say a cadetship or something at a local accounting firm? So you can do like, instead of working in a law firm, you can start your career a little bit earlier. Oh, I mean, I, that did cross my mind. I think I made the decision to not, I suppose, get too, I don't know, focused on the accounting career bit while I was at uni. I mean, I do know a lot of people that work in accounting and study at the same time, but I decided mm. that over the, I, w- I wanted to get uni done within the three years and not extend it and yeah. then kind of just just go through it and not um, I don't know, be stuck because I feel like potentially it's just harder studying and learning. Well, there's pros and cons, right? Because so, you were working anyway, right? I was, so yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Working three days a week at the at the law firm yeah. and studying. And because I'd had that job previously, you know, I was like, oh, you know, let's just keep going until it's easy I get to do. It's comfortable. Yeah. 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 It was easy. Okay. 
I noticed you're wearing um, your corporate branded <laughs> t-shirt. Yeah, no. I was like, is that every day? Is it like, is that your way of, because do, do you work from home or from an office? Yeah, this is my home office. So this is okay. home. You, you only work from home, right? Correct. So is that your way of like getting into, you know, the right mindset? You, you get out of bed, you brush your teeth and you put on your little miss. Oh, no, this is a complete facade. I'm in active wear 90% of the time. <laughs> So when I, when I, I mean, when I do client meetings, obviously I, I put a, a, a face on and, and make sure my hair is not a mess. Um, but no, to be honest, I dress for comfort most of the time. Um, yeah. And there are some clients who do come to see me and they'll see me in my active wear and they know and they don't do, care. <laughs> do they actually come and see you at your home? Uh, very rarely. I do have a few clients that happy to travel or they're nearby and you know i'm happy for them to pop by but i would say like 90 percent of my like contact will be remotely whether it's zoom calls yeah yeah and you put you actually put on your t-shirt as well for that yes well (laughs) if it's not this it's something slightly professional yeah okay with your clients like is it very old school clients that still feel they need to see because like it is is it it like advisory stuff that you do for them oh clients i mean i do a whole bunch of things to be honest most of my clients aren't aren't going to be like quote unquote old school they're millennials like me maybe a little bit older but um even the slightly older clients are very Mm. much happy to do like the remote type stuff Okay. So yeah. So what do, what do, what do people need to come and see you for? Because like it's bookkeeping. Like you've done their books. That's it. Yeah, I mean some some clients they they really struggle to write emails or text, and a phone call might be good for them. But sometimes they're like Michelle, you know, can I pop by? And it's just easier just to have a a quick chat or a long chat. Doesn't really matter. Um, I'm you know very flexible um, with those certain clients, and you know we'll we'll knock out all their questions a lot quicker than say like a back and forth email or text or whatever. and is it about the books or like do they ask you business stuff like oh, could, it could be anything i mean yeah I, i'll have clients come see me if we talk about like their year-end stuff mm-hmm. um other times it's like hey michelle i've got this issue can i come see you because they want to see me face to face for whatever reason but you know that's again like 90 percent of clients i'll deal with them i'll communicate them yeah. remotely we've got with do- them remotely do they get to sit in that armchair, the, the pretty armchair behind you? Is that oh, they, can sit, Is that... they can sit here. We sit at my <laughs> kitchen table. I've had one of my tradie clients bring his dinner and like, hey, mate, come around at six. I was eating dinner. He was eating dinner. He brought ice cream. We, t- we spoke about his tax planning. So. <laughs> awesome. I like what, that. Whatever it's works. Good, it's a good little community feel then. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. What would you be doing if you weren't an accountant? Oh my goodness, this is such a hard question. Is, is that even a possibility in your head? I, like... I mean, I feel like whatever kind of role I would take would have some sort of like accounting element in it. Um, just because I love, like, it's what I love to do. And, you know, it's, to me, it's kind of like easy. If I went to go and become, I don't know, like a nurse, like, oh my God, can't do it with what, can't do it with anybody. Like, don't, <laughs> don't put me in that situation. Um, yeah. I honestly don't know. When people ask me, so if you want an accountant, would you be like, that's a scary question. <laughs> wow. So, it's, but it's really good. Like you said, like, this is what I still enjoy doing. Yeah. Because um, people like, you know, you read about stats and people change their career, I think, three times throughout their lifetime. At least, I think that's the average. Yeah. For millennials, it's probably like double that. I don't know. Yeah, no, um, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> some sort of business owner. I just don't know what that would be exactly. Okay. Yeah. But you see yourself kind of sticking to it for the foreseeable future. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Could you ever see yourself like going to, because you've only ever done practice really. Yes. Could you yourself being, like, see yourself being an accountant in commerce? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Really? Like if, if there was a situation where I wasn't doing what I was doing and someone's like, hey, Michelle, come, you know, head my finance team. Yeah. Like I could, I could totally see myself. You wouldn't find that boring because you wouldn't have a whole bunch of clients coming over for dinner and you know oh, in I, mean, kitchen. I, think, I think there's pros and cons to each so it would definitely shake things up um yeah, i suppose it would depend on the business too that if what what scope of work i would be doing but i mean that's always an option yeah if, okay. I, if i if i'm like no nope, don't want to run a, a firm anymore 
Because like I find people that love practice, they love the client interaction. But they love the variety and they yeah. love the pressure of it as well. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's busy, it's engaging, yeah. you know, there's stuff happening. Whereas in commerce, it's kind of, you know, it's a bit slower, it's mundane, it's kind of fairly repetitive after a while. After your first three or six months, they say, it's like, yeah, look, I came in there, like, you know, with my kind of gung-ho practice approach, I've improved everything, yeah. processes are working, I've automated stuff. I'm like, after six months, like, it's not much else to do for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is the grass greener? I don't know. I've never been in that situation, so... Fair enough. Well, I mean, you speaking of which is a good little segue. Like, you've only ever worked in two firms um, after you graduated from uni. Yes. Prior to opening up your own successful bookkeeping business, and uh, look, it, it, it's an always it's always an interesting topic for partners, and I guess others listening to to the podcast is like, what makes people leave their jobs? Um, what was it for you that made you leave those two roles? Ah. Uh... I'll, I'll, it'd probably be easier if I explain the backstory. So I have a very typical accounting career story. Finished high school, did my three-year commerce degree, got my grad job, stayed at that firm for just under three years, uh, decided to move to another firm, stayed there for another four, um, and then became self-employed. So um, while I was in my second uh, firm, I got into sort of like fitness and bodybuilding. And um, long story short, I started a e-commerce activewear fitness accessories brand with my uh, sister-in-law. Yep. And that was just a side hustle. That was just like a fun little thing that we did together. We both had no experience in, in running a fitness slash e-commerce brand. But it grew quite quickly, probably in um, year three and four. And I ended up sort of taking, going from full time to four days a week. And we got to this point where we were really busy in our e-commerce business that I walked into a meeting with my bosses asking for wanting, wanting three days a week. Um, mm -hmm. And I walked out pretty much saying, I need to leave. I need to give this e-commerce business a good hot crack. Um, so that was probably like the driver of me stepping out of that that role um, so did you quit that day basically yeah pretty much you, you, you went you went from three days to zero days i went from four days and then the the question that kind of really struck me was my boss at the time said oh okay michelle i will give you three days but how long do you think you'll be here still and i thought about it and i was like oh my goodness like well, it depends how many millions, and yeah, how many millions and am like, I going to make? Honestly, like... six more months and I'll probably be gone. So, Did you say that? Yeah, I, I was kind. I was like, oh, my God, like massive realization. Like, So, yeah, well, would you have like a really good, honest relationship with your boss? Or... Yeah, I mean, I love my, my prior bosses. Um, they, the, the, like, they were so supportive throughout um, transitioning and, you know, allowing me to kind of do my side hustle thing while working for them. So, yeah, I was so, so grateful for their support. Mm -hmm. And then obviously I, I left them, um, did the, the full-time thing um, with the e-commerce business and uh, my sister-in-law and I were at this crossroads. So I had started, well, I'd been bookkeeping on the side for a pre few years previous to that. Basically. Yeah, you had two side hustles. Basically. <laughs> I tell you, 2014 was a very busy year. 2014. I know, you were doing your CA, you had two side hustles. I'm was like... I still doing my CA? Oh my goodness, maybe I was finishing. Um, but I we, I just started, we started the, the e-commerce business. Um, I was became a BAS agent solely just to do one BAS for a friend's business. So I was for like four years, I did his BAS and then I went to my BAS. Oh, can you just sign me off? I just need to do my friend's BAS for like four years. Yeah, that's fine. I left my, my firm, my prior firm, to do e, um, the e-commerce business full time. And I kept bookkeeping on the side just to pay the bills, just to kind of like that transition. Um, and we got to... You, st did you, you started bookkeeping before the active wear one? Yeah, it was it was in the same year. Okay, how did that come? How did like you told us the activewear, which we'll delve into? But how did the bookkeeping start? Oh, so my friend started his um, own like manufacturing business, and he's yep. like, "Hey Michelle, hey Michelle, I need help. Can you help me with my basses?" I was like, "Cool, got my bass agent registration. Was like yep. one bass in quarter <laughs> for like four years." Okay, did you charge him for it? Or... <laughs> yeah, but that okay. that was it. Like, 
um, that was the bookkeeping business. That was the bookkeeping the business. Okay, yeah. so one, but did you actually do any bookkeeping, or was it just Baz? Um, uh, no, it was pretty much a little. Oh, yeah, Baz, because they did um the bookkeeping internally, which was not a lot, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the bookkeeping business was still uh, very infant stages. It was pretty much <laughs> just um, not doing a lot for like five, six years. Yeah. Yeah. And then you were, so the active wear was kind of like the, the focus. Um, yeah. What made you get into it? Like, I know you said you were into bodybuilding, but like, you know, most people kind of are happy with their Lululemons and their Lorna Janes and what, like, there's just so much variety in the market. What makes someone go, you know what? I'm going to make a better one or a different one. Um, active I mean, I, I got into fitness. Um, a friend took me to her own bodybuilding show, got a bit inspired, went, why not? Let's add it to the bucket list. I had, I, I was just going through a year of like, yes, man. Like, you know, yes, man says yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I'm movie. doing it. Like I went to live in Japan previously, said yes to this. I was having a, a yes year. Um, anyway, I love wait, wait, you went to Japan for how long? Uh, four months. Is that while you're still a video? Uh, no, that was when, um, I was at my prior firm. I did, I did it over a quiet period. So Again, I was having a yes year. I had another friend was like, hey, Michelle, I'm going to do a snow season. Come with me. I was like, hold on. Let me talk to my boss if I can take unpaid leave over our quiet season, Christmas. Yeah. It was in early Jan. And she's like, yeah, no problem. Just make sure you come, come back. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I went to Japan and then I did bodybuilding and then I started an e-commerce business. Wow. How old were you at that time? Oh, 2014. Um, I would have been... Or early 20s, I can't, I don't know exactly. 23, 22? Okay. Four months in Japan, like just the snow? Yeah, correct. So um, I was uh, working, living and working um, in Hakuba. So I was yep. working at um, just one of the cafeterias. Okay. Did life. you become like a pro skier after that? Um, I like snowboarding. So I learned to snowboard while I was there. <laughs> love, love it. What do you think of your experience there? Like, was that? four months right just in that ski resort right like you didn't go anywhere else to no, live yeah to correct so i've yeah, been okay. to japan before i love japan i studied japanese when i was in high school um, so uh, it was my second okay. time back um yeah. and yeah i pretty much took like a four month sabbatical and i had to come back because i had to finish my audit module and see <laughs> <CA. laughs> um I was actually part studying um, while I was there because it had started and I'm like it in the timing. But I love the experience. I met people that I would never cross paths with um, in my lifetime. You know, like the culture is so different. The work experience is so different. Um, yeah, I mean, I would recommend anyone to do some sort of similar experience, like step out of their comfort zone and just, yeah. you know, try. How far? How far did you go in your bodybuilding? Um, so I did it over about a four week, uh, sorry, four years. I did wow. one one season a year. So, um, it, like actually competing in every. Correct. Yeah. So when when people think of bodybuilding, they're like, "Oh, big muscle person." But I was doing, um, I was a bikini competitor. So yeah. it's kind of like the entry level of like I don't know, people call it body sculpting or whatever. But you join a federation um, and you prep and train to that style so there's certain things that the judges will judge you for I was doing IFBB um and I just kind of got not addicted but like I love the process of training you because you train for I suppose getting your body into that shape and then you do like a yeah. four-month cut to get it to stage condition I know the last four because I, I, I've got some friends um that are like really big into it and win as well consistently but I've seen them. It was like, wow, the stuff that they have to go through and they put their bodies through, especially the last, I think, four weeks, like the yeah. intense cutting where they're just like no carbs and just eating like chicken and broccoli. Yeah, it it. yeah. It's it's one of those like things that you, you, can't, you can't do it long term to sustain, but it's kind of yeah. like you, you know you've got a, I don't know, four-month period, you step on stage, and then you can kind of like go back to sort of some sort of normal life. And you enjoyed that? Like what? Know. What you actually got addicted to it? Yeah, well, I don't know if addictive is the right word, but you know, I was like, okay, I want to do this first comp, and I really enjoyed it. And then, you know, I did one comp each year after for the for, for four years. I think I did four seasons. When you say enjoyed the process, what do you mean? Oh, 
you learn so much about your body and how you fuel your body and how you can use that fuel with, you know, your carbs and I don't know, mm. it's, it's very eye-opening because um, there's, there's so many gurus out there saying keto diet, this diet, that yeah. diet. So I have or, um, or I had a, a coach who kind of worked out what I need to be eating, how to be training and how you can just reduce your food intake by look like nothing and still be dropping or increasing, say, your yeah. walk from 40 minutes to 50 minutes and still be leaning down. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The calories in, calories out kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What made you stop then if you were like so into it? Uh, the business probably. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cause it's a lot of work. It is. It is like when you're working full time, training mornings, training nights, sticking to eating and then running a side hustle. And that's probably one of the reasons why I decided to put full time into the e-commerce. It just got too much. Mm. Um, and I do want to do, I, I, I would like to step on stage again, I think, um, probably, probably like in my like late mid to late thirties when I have a little bit more time to kind of like, cause you, you have to be quite selfish with your time. You have to yeah. dedicate those four months to your eating and training and mm. working career does kind of have to take a back seat. So yeah. Um, yeah. One day. Oh, that's awesome. Do you still like train now? And like yeah. I've taken a lot of that knowledge into your training. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I definitely go to the gym regularly. Um, you know, three times a week is probably my, yeah, and do a lot of weights and stuff like that. Yeah, my my training styles changed a lot. I definitely went from heavy lifting to a lot of more mobility stuff, just because a lot of heavy lifting, you, you know, you're really quite tight and not very flexible. And as mm. you kind of like get older, you realize, you know, you've got to look after yourself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, is there any other cool stuff that you did from your bucket list? Now I'm intrigued. Cool stuff. I don't know. I don't know what you can't think of as cool. Well, Japan, bodybuilding. I went to Japan, bodybuilding. Like, yeah, I'm such a typical accountant, aren't I? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. What about, so back to the active wear, right? Yeah. Um, what, what, I guess, what inspired you to just do your own thing? You know, what, what was wrong with Lululemon? <laughs> um okay so um so aura eve is the brand you can still find it online it's now sold yeah. to um someone else but i was really big into like like the whole glute booty training whatever so when we started aura eve five years ago we essentially took a product already on the market and rebranded it to our own and remarketed it mm -hmm. um so like we were known as like having our booty bands so yeah you know, so that you started the booty bands first okay well we we definitely added like we wouldn't have we didn't pioneer it, but we got in at that kind of like incline yeah. of, of the, the whole booty fitness um, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because we we had active wear and other things, but nine out of nine out of ten of our sales were specifically our booty bands. So okay. we grew our business based on pretty much one product. And it was a bit different to what was on the market. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I had a look at it. Yeah, it does look a bit different. Like yes, yes, a little bit more strong. design, yeah. but they the um the way you use it and result is essentially yeah. what other booty bands are, are doing. Do you still use it now as part of your training? Um, I haven't used it for a while actually because I I do like group fitness training, so you know yeah, okay. But that I still have all my booty bands there, and <laughs> your friends will like still message me or whatever about the booty bands. So yeah. What made you was Hannah? So was it Hannah your my sister? Partner? My sister in law. Yeah. sister in law. Yeah. Was she training with you? Was she like on this journey with you? Is that how you guys both decided to get into the business? No. So um, we were living together, and. I think I just woke up one day and was like, I really want to like bring this product to the market. So me being accountant for likes fitness and Hannah, who she, um, she had sort of like a little bit of a background in like Facebook advertising, but she'd been doing photography for a while. So, mm. you know, we, we just kind of like, you like, that's a useful skill. So let's do it. We used our skills to kind of build this brand. So back in the day, I remember like running around the back of Nambour, like getting <laughs> photos and active wearing booty bands. Um, yep. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's wild to think what we what what happened back then. Well, and how what was the what was the biggest challenge of like getting it? Well, how long did it take like from conception to, to um, market? Um, I think it was about a year, sort of like building everything, suppliers, like the whole logistics. 
and the we took off when we we ran one ad around it was like a giveaway ad and that pretty much put us like facebook and instagram made us so mm. we ran this like little competition and the ads like that i don't know if it was an ad it must have been an ad just kind of went semi-viral um, yeah. and from then on we sort of like gained traction with followers and, and orders so you just kind of saw the orders go up and up and up so i'm waking up at five o'clock packing orders doing customer service emails same thing with han and then coming in um you know after you know your nine to five job and doing the same thing until and, like night time yeah wow and then doing your training as well correct yes that's so yeah. <laughs> busy yeah um, well, are you naturally like very structured and organized in how you approach things or is it just like the pressure and just deadlines and deadlines kind of thing? Um, you, oh, you work I'm, well to I'm, that? I'm an account, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm a Capricorn, so I'm a very like atypical, like I like things in a certain way. I'm not OCD, but I definitely like structure and routine and planning stuff. So, Got you. Yeah, I'm, that's me. Okay. Do you believe in your astrology? <laughs> well, I don't, but I think... <laughs> I'm like, make a mental note, only high in Capricorn. I, I like to ask people their star, star signs sometimes. Not that I'm big on like star signs, but I think it does. Sometimes it does kind of like betray. Like my, I'm, I'm a true Capricorn. My character, if you look at Capricorn, that's Michelle. And my like yeah. partner's a Sagittarius. And you look up Sagittarius, like spontaneous. Like, but I'm like, that's him to a T. So. <laughs> How does that work together? Um, I mean. What, what, one's a plan and one's spontaneous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, well, it means that. He makes me have more fun and I make him, like, have more structure. Be more so. honest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Compliments each other. Yes. What was yeah. it like, um, I mean, you mentioned, like, partnerships and I've been in a business partnership as well. Like, it's it's not always the easiest thing in the world. Um, what was your experience like? I mean, I think with every relationship, whether it's business relationship, personal relationship, you're going to have your ups and downs. Um, and... Like it, that whole business, I learned so much from. I learned, and I'm so grateful for because the stuff I learned before we sold it, I get to apply it to you know my clients and mm. their business relationships. And be like, you know, they'll come to me with um, ideas or issues or whatever, and I I can apply. Or oh, actually, you know, me and my ex business partner did this or didn't do yeah. this, and you know, because a lot of your clients are e commerce clients as well, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, anyone who's had a business partnership, they like, can sort of like understand ups and downs and then, you know, what they should have done in the beginning, maybe what they shouldn't have done. And when you sell a business like that, that's really hard too. For us, it was really hard, but we, we were at a crossroads. A lot of things had changed for us. I, for whatever reason, my bookkeeping business grew astronomically in sort of like probably the last 12 months before sale my sister-in-law was starting family uh so it was like we, we had to pick our priority yeah. and yeah so we we decided given how busy you were with the active wear business um well the, the fitness business how did the bookkeeping grow because it sounds like the you know the fitness one was quite full-on especially as it was growing yeah how did the bookkeeping kind of take off at the same time then Oh, I'm trying to think back to what happened. So, like, I pretty much finished working for my old firm and then I think naturally I just started picking up clients. So um, whether they – I mean, I it was probably referrals back then because I've been, you know – From that one Baz client? Oh, no, just from industry <laughs> referrals, like colleagues or other accountants that knew me who was like, oh, hey, talk to Michelle. She knows this shit because she's been doing tax compliance for so long. So I think naturally someone kind of be like, oh, hey, Michelle, can you help me with like this bass or bookie? I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. And then another person, I think next minute I was doing all these clients. Is that because you told people that you left and you kind of on your own? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like a secret or anything. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, people knew I was like doing the e-commerce thing pretty much like that was my focus, but, mm. you know, to kind of not take money out of the business and we have, you know, staff in that business as well. So it was kind of more, it was more economical to keep the staff there and then I would just kind of do the bookkeeping. How many staff did you have? Uh, we had one other um, who's actually one of my team members in Lewis Bookkeeping. Okay. Yeah. So she did like all the admin stuff, I would imagine. Yeah, she did all the like social media. So um, she, once we sold the business, I was like, 
hey, like come across this room <laughs> here, like pretty much nothing's going to yeah. change. <laughs> Straight away. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. And did, was she helping in the bookkeeping business from the get-go? No, no. So that was okay. me for like just me for a very long time. You know that decision at the point in time when you decided, hey, I'm going to like go out on my own and leave uh, instead of doing this three days a week. Have you, had you replaced your income already at BDO with uh, the fitness No, business? I knew I would have to take a pretty big cut. Okay. So, you know, that was the decision with me and my partner to be like, hey, we're going to give this a red pop crack. You know, um, if I can sustain at least, you know, well, like six months if, you know, we'll replace my income and hopefully to be all good. So, yeah. Yeah. I knew, the, yeah, I knew that it would, we would have this kind of like up and down, but. How long did it take you to replace it? Like once you, once you left and oh, focused on it? I honestly can't remember because I left in about August 2018. Um, I, I can't remember. People ask me, and I'm like six months, 12 months. Like <laughs> so don't ask me, like I don't, I would just take money when I needed it and like leave it there when I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> Typical business owner kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, not what I like advise my clients, but I did it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, again, do as I say, not my, as I do. My experience, like, don't do what Michelle did. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like doctors and everyone else. Do as I do as I say, not do as, as I, I do. do. Yes. Um, no, that's that's really cool, and I think it's important to have run your own business a before like being able to advise others. That helps because I find a lot oh, of accounting yeah. partners especially ones that kind of like progress to partnership, you know, uh, from, you know, cadet or grad, they've never had that experience of having to start something from scratch. Um, they just kind of grew their portfolio and just one day became a partner, but they're still expected to be, to know how to run a business yeah. and advise their yeah. clients. So it's, yeah, it's a good experience. And I met some partners that literally, um, I, was, I had someone in my podcast, I think Peter Layla from Blue Rock, I remember he he was a manager or a senior accountant as well, and then he started a like a hospitality business, having a, like a, a bar or something like that with some of his mates. And the only reason for it was like I wanted to see what it was like to run a business. Yeah. You know, like I'm I'm telling my clients how to run theirs, but I've never run my own. So um, and now he's like super yeah. uber successful. Yeah. So I wanted to I guess ask you with the partners, you know, when you left especially the whole bookkeeping thing, they were completely comfortable with you having your side hustles and didn't, you know, like, what was the conversation like? Do they like, no, 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 like you need to focus, you know, on your work and we were a little bit worried that it might take away your focus. You might not meet your deadlines. Like, was there any hesitation when you said, hey, by the way, I'm starting, you know, this business and that business? No, I mean, I, I'm just trying to think back to those conversations. I remember going up to one of my bosses and going, sign this piece of paper, which is just confirming that I had, I was competent to get my bass agent registration. You know, I was yeah. very honest and upfront. This is so I literally can do one client, like one friend's bass for, for the next four years. So, you know, that really didn't impact my, my work. And yeah, it was more, um, and then with Aura Eve, like everyone knew what I was doing. I had started the business probably around the same time I started that job. So it wasn't like, I don't know, they, they've always been really supportive. And I think if okay. potentially my performance in that role had dropped and they had pulled me up to be like, hey, Michelle, like we have an issue, maybe that conversation had gone a lot differently. But it was, you know, I was very open about it. You know, they never brought up any sort of issues around, you know, me yeah. doing what I need to do for my nine to five. So... Did you become like the most efficient worker there? Because you're like, should I have to go, you know, five o'clock, I've got, I've got packing to do. You know? so like, uh, boom, I don't boom, know. Boom, boom, I, mean, I, I felt like I was just working like longer hours because like, I don't know. I just, it just seemed like that. It seemed like a lifetime ago. But I know it was only a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I'm, again, I'm so grateful for like my bosses being so supportive because I know a lot of people are quite scared to, I suppose, start their side hustles and, and be yeah. really honest with their bosses, like, hey, I've got this going on, you know, yeah. can can you help support me? Because I encourage anyone to start their own business only because I've learned so much from it. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Um, have you always had, like, this entrepreneurial streak in you? I think so. I think so. That's probably one of the reasons why in high school, like, I wanted to become an accountant or be in business somehow and... Yeah. Like, do you, are your parents running their own business or anything uh, like that? Or? My parents did run um, a restaurant, like, when I was a teenager. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like that was for a few years. Um, and then they became, and then, um, that... so you were one of the kids that are like, they're forced to waitress and help out and all that all the time. <laughs> Cause so... I always see that in family restaurant businesses. <laughs> I was the child who got to work, you know, Friday, Saturday nights and during school holidays. And yep. yeah, I was, yeah, definitely. It's a good grounding. I, I always see those kids turn out to be pretty hardworking. I think, yeah, it definitely opened your eyes up. Cause yeah, my parents were working so hard in that business and you know mum would leave to go in the morning to get all the stuff ready for for the day and prepping was, and she, then, was she doing filler food or it was thai and filipino thai filipino okay now when you were like opening up your you know the business well both of them like what, what were some of the considerations in mind like did you have a strategy just like you know i'm gonna blow this thing up or is it just like give it a go and just see what happens. Like, oh, I had no was... idea what I was doing. This was, I was going completely <laughs> blind. Like, no, I had no plan. And <laughs> that's the honest truth. So um, with Balloon and Sport Keeping, you know, I think I officially started that late 20, not, at 2014. It wasn't until we sold Aura Eve, um, did the official changeover New Year's Eve twenty. 20- 19 that I was like okay from the 1st of January 2020 I'm full-time in my own bookkeeping firm and that's it I now I'm going to have vision and going to make a plan in place but for a very mm. long time when this bookkeeping was just like over there or of Eve was kind of like it was definitely growing um we thought about what we wanted to do nothing nothing like written or yeah mm. it was let's see where this takes us again do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, very good. Tell us about the learnings about like the partnership or what would you do differently in that business? Um, uh, I don't know. I think what, what, what did I learn from that business? Um, definitely get professional help, even though like you, like business owners struggle to kind of invest money in certain areas. Mm. And thinking back, there's some things that, I would have done differently. For example, we looked at trademarking and then that's like a whole big time cost investment and we kind of like had to go at trademarking, like the booty building name and other things and that kind of happened but didn't. And thinking back to it, when we sold, if we had locked down a few additional trademarks, I think maybe that would have been like better for the intellectual property around the business. Mm -hmm. Um, Like just general partnership shareholder agreements you know like having your war chest set up if xyz happened yeah so um yeah so you know when when someone comes to me with like two business owners who work together come to me and work together i say you know have you got like if it come, have you got a shareholder agreement in place like what happens if one of you suddenly passes who's going to like be running the business like yeah. i think i learn a lot about just getting an Every situation, your ducks in a row, a war chest, because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Did you, like, when you talk about ups and downs or, you know, with your business partnership, like, besides that, was there anything else that, you know, you would do differently or approach differently or maybe even not encourage people to have a business partner at all? Or oh, did it make it easier? I don't know. I think because there's so many pros and cons to having business partners. You mm. get to bounce ideas off each other. You do have that really, you have that support that you're not alone. I feel like a lot of solo business owners feel a little bit alone. And I sort of never had that when we were growing or at oh, you were You were living together the entire time? No. So um, we were living together for a little bit. And then I ended up um, like moving out with my partner. But, you know, in the, I remember, I remember vividly, we launched the site. It was like, I don't know, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock and I was running then and Han ran into my room, jumping up and she's like, oh my God, Michelle, we made our first sale. Like, that's really cool. Like you get to share the ups, you know? Yep. And then like, there's, there's going to be down, there's going to be downs where you're like, oh my goodness, that sale didn't go as well. Like we're going to, we have cash flow issues. And mm-hmm. there are those hard times where you have to convince like we're going to have to put capital in the business to meet, you know, the next like month of expenses. Like yeah. I need you to put money in or you need to me to put money in. And then obviously logistically it can be hard. Disagreements are going to happen. And again, with any relationship, there's going to be compromise. So yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. 
It's always hard, especially you know you had a staff member, salaries to pay, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's probably good for. I think the benefit that I found from my partnership was um, accountability. Um, you find your work harder when you know that someone else kind of like keeping you accountable or expects something from you yeah versus... I do, yeah i do think you have like responsibility to yeah you know, someone you know partner come to you like hey michelle have you done this it's like oh no i better get it done as a priest exactly I, mean, right now, like... I, could, I could go to the beach and sit on the beach and no one's going to question yes me. exactly except your clients that are waiting for the books to be done yeah <laughs> <laughs> um okay cool so tell us about your business now so you've got little miss bookkeeper big bookkeeping yeah. Um, tell us how that business is structured. Um, okay. So I have, so everyone sort of knows me as Little Miss Bookkeeping because that's how I've built the branding and the name and, you know, Mm. I've had questions about should I change it because people make the assumption I only do bookkeeping and nothing else when historically I'm actually a tax accountant doing compliance for seven years and then went back to doing bookkeeping just to pay the bills and then decided that I would just grow the bookkeeping, you know, not planning to. Um, So I have my like bookkeeping business and then all the bookkeeping arm. And then I decided to get my tax agent registration uh, over a year ago and um, add on my accounting arm. So I've named that Neapolitan Collective and it's sort of, it's, we're, it, it's the same team. I mean, we're under the same umbrella, but it's for, for sort of like for the branding. business model and branding, it has two separate arms. Yeah. You told me about the the, the logic behind the name, the whole like when yeah. you the bookkeeping, <laughs> strawberry is your compliance. And yeah. Like chocolate yeah. is your like so, advisory kind of thing. Yeah. Vanilla, vanilla is the bookkeeping. Bookie yeah. is boring, but, you know, everyone sort of like needs it. Um, strawberry is not everyone's favorite flavor, but it's like the tax and accounting. It's still required as part of the, the, the collective and chocolate is like education. So it's like, going to have like scoops of ice cream all over your website. Well, I haven't built the, like the website for Neapolitan doesn't ex- quite exist yet. Um, yeah, but is that what it's going to be? Just ice cream everywhere? Little, maybe, yeah, little... I don't know. I haven't thought about it, but yeah, like, why <laughs> Neapolitan work? I'm like, oh, cause like it's bookkeeping. keeping accounting <laughs> um, no no i like it it's logical it's different as well <laughs> yeah um like i'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be like michelle night tax like boring like, come on. boring yeah <laughs> how do you market that you know um i can i can already see some uh the tagline i could be a marketing consultant it's like get some flavor you know <laughs> compliance you know yeah get some Bring, I bring the flavor to your tax. Something oh, like that. Oh, 100%. You know, yeah. why, why do we have to make accounting so boring? Like, come on, guys. <laughs> it can be as delicious as, as an ice cream flavor. Like, There we go. <laughs> you let me know about the consulting thing. <laughs> um, what's been, I guess, the... Well, actually, look, let, let's go back to the structure. So you've got... Um, how many clients have you got now? Oh, I've re- like varying degrees of engagement, whether it's end-to-end bookkeeping or just passes or just tax returns. Um, yeah. But we have average about 100 clients. Which um, is nuts, right? Because like you've really only gone out full-time or dedicated yourself to it the last couple of years. Correct, yes. Yeah, so it's awesome. Congrats. Um, and you've also, so you've got the person onshore that helps you with just admin. Does she do any bookkeeping for you or does she just kind of, do client server slash admin? No, so she's my make everything pretty person. So is, <laughs> like if you see my social media stuff, like web, like actually our website was done externally, but yeah, she'll she she'll, maintains. She it. makes everything pretty. That is her role. <laughs> Maintain uh, my you know Mailchimp is that, list. Is that a full time job? Uh, no, well she's only part time, but I'm getting her to do more and more work. So you know okay. maybe she'll do more and more for me. <laughs> Uh, so how hands-on are you then with, you know, having 100 clients and you've got three staff offshore? Correct, yes. How hands-on are you then? Oh, I'm working too much. <laughs> like how many hours are you putting in then per week? Oh, don't ask me. Don't ask you questions you know what answers to. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely investing a lot of time because I still do a lot of client work, um, you know, a lot of like admin type tasks and a lot of client contact. Mm. Um, but... Probably the main reason for that is my focus this year is getting my systems kind of running smoothly and documented and everything like that. So one thing COVID taught me 
is to have everything running efficiently, have every, have um, a process for everything. So yeah. that's why did COVID teach you that, by the way? Because oh, it was it was madness. Like I went full time in January. COVID hit in March, and like every other account in Australia, we were like job keeper, cash flow boost. Like we just we couldn't. Like I mean, I just couldn't deal with 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 the workload. Mm. So that you know, to the the degree we're affecting my health, we're affecting relationships, and I'm just working way too much. So like coming into crazy to, hours, just it, I was I didn't realize how burnt out I was until mm. I think one week one day I woke up and I just couldn't get out of bed. I was like, <laughs> guys, like I'm really sick. I think like my body is telling me something. Yeah. So that was uh, really how, really how, how far into COVID was that? I reckon it would have been maybe like coming into the new financial year, like July or August. Okay. Probably after. Do most, do most of your clients have an accountant in there as well? Um, so. Or do they just rely on you? As the no. Bookkeeper? So I still work with, I still get like referral work from other accountants yeah. saying, oh, Michelle does bookkeeping, you know, work with her. And, uh, you know, I think if you have a bookkeeper separate to accountant, you know, that's a dream team. Yeah. Um, so account refer work to me to be like, hey, Michelle, does can you do your bookkeeping best? We don't do that for whatever reason. They'll just use tax compliance. Yep. Um, you know, I'll get it clean, do BASs nice and clean, ready for year end and be like, hey, accountant, you know, it's all good, ready for you to go. Yep. Um, yeah, so and then on the flip side, if clients don't have tax agents already and I'm happy to take them on as a accounting client then i will like i don't give everyone that option i like to you know i'll transition the people who i think are appropriate i'm not going to steal other people's client but yeah yeah, that's why probably why i don't really advertise the neapolitan collective at all because you don't want to sabotage the referral kind of stream or well i don't because i like i love doing what i do and to like you prefer bookkeeping over accounting no oh no I, okay. I really like, I'm, I'm one of like, I think a lot of accountants say this, they like the high end, like consulting, yeah. high end contact work, which I really like. But I think one of the mistakes I made early on with bookkeeping was taking on anyone and everyone. Mm. So if I do take on clients on the like accounting arm, I'm very selective mm. around that. Otherwise okay. I'll just refer them to like another tax agent to be like, I do like the bookkeeping in best, but do you mind doing the tax returns? Yep. For whatever reason. I'm like, oh yeah, cool. No problem. Or it might okay. be something, an, an industry that I just, like, doesn't light me up to do the highest level stuff. Mm. Okay. So, but uh, I guess I'm curious, with the, all the COVID stuff, do they, because you were doing bookkeeping, like, and generally if you, most people have a bookkeeper, but then they also have an accountant. And then for the COVID grant letters and all that sort of stuff, most people kind of went to their accountant, not to their bookkeeper, as far as I know. But I might be wrong. It depends. Um yeah, it's, it's did, you, so did you try that? Did you like, oh, look, I'm just your bookkeeper. Why don't you go and see your accountant and get that letter from them? Yeah, I mean, I always question to be like, hey, have you reached out to your tax agent? They're going to be, they know your business better or whatever reason they're mm. going to be more appropriate. It's going to be more appropriate for them to do yeah. that. And it could be flipped. I'd have um, tax agents go refer them back to me. But, oh, no, Michelle's fine to do that. You do it. Like, she can do it. <laughs> so it's like... Yeah. Did you charge your clients for all of that stuff? I did not charge my clients enough. <laughs> okay, but you charged something. Yeah, yeah. I think, again, I think with a lot of clients, we did a lot of free work in 2020. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, coming into 2021, they need help with certain government stimulus. Here's a proposal, pay it up front, and we get the work done. Like, How much are you charging for it now? It depends. Like, I think... Because I, I implemented a few new software from 1st of July to, to deal with some of those pain points I was having in the prior mm-hmm. financial year, like carbon and practice ignition. So, okay. yeah. It's like it, your new tax stack, basically. Yeah. Does it make a difference? Oh, a thousand percent. Really? I don't know, I don't know how I ran a business without some of these. Because <laughs> I hear like, yeah, like the likes of Andrew and uh, so many now, like Nat, uh, that we talked about, you know, they're all about their tax stack. Um, 
So you're saying it has made a massive difference? Oh, uh, yeah. I was def- I was sitting on the fence about a few things, you know. Because they're all expensive, right? Like, they all add up. You just keep adding all these SaaS solutions. Yeah. Well. yeah. I mean, they definitely do add up, and I probably need to do a full review of my stack and see if I can cull anything. Mm. But, you know, there was – I did have specific pain points, and I needed to find solutions for them. So, you know, I was getting, like, so many emails each day, and I needed to get them out to my client, like, my team to be like, we need this action, this action, this action. I was doing still um, our proposal like in like VS, v, yeah, our quotes to clients were still very clunky. So yeah. I was like, no, nah, we're getting practice ignition. If it doesn't work, then it What were you work. doing before? Like manual like, kind of real word? Real manual stuff. Like just yeah. out of zero, just doing. And so we, we gave that a go. I absolutely love practice ignition. And, and then carbon probably... I, yeah, it was the best decision I made coming into this financial year. Is it because especially you've got the offshore team or if you've, not really, just regardless? It would just, have... yeah, I mean, an email would come in and like forward it to my team or whatever. Now everyone can see everything the way Carbon work. We can add comments. Like it's just more visual and yep. we can get shit done quicker because yep. that solved some of the biggest issues we were okay. having. What else? Like what, what else is in your tech stack? What else do you use between you and your teams and your clients? Uh, so we're a zero-based firm. We love... 100% zero? Uh, not 100% zero. Because I know you're um, QuickBooks certified as well. Yeah, we did. I, I mean, back again, things I've learned. Um, <laughs> when I started bookkeeping, I did take on some QuickBooks clients. Um, so I do either have a couple of them or I'm in the middle of transitioning them. But yeah, yeah I'm zero fast is like the number one. Um, I won't take on my clients because, like, yes, I'll, that's what I'll say on that. And... I'm a zero snob now. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, like, we use XPM and, like, we're Microsoft 365 and I don't know what else I could tell you. It's a big it's a big tech stack, like. Okay. Do you use, like, Slack and Sun or any of that sort of stuff as well? Or No, we so Carbon sort of, like, took, has all of that has, has built kind in. of solved that issue for me but yeah we'll okay. use like microsoft teams for communicating and like internally and yeah. yeah okay did you do any advertising like your client base to grow to 100 was it all organic you just like just referrals or did you actually advertise go out do any networking marketing anything uh not no real structured marketing approach so yeah the only things we've done is um, one of my clients, Apex Digital, rebuilt my website recently and they do my SEO. So um, they've definitely helped me with like Google rankings that way. Do you get a lot of leads from that? Um, I'd have, to be honest, again, like this is not my area of expertise. This is my admin. Um, so I'd have to see where the leads are coming from that way. But yeah. when I do speak to clients, um, a lot of the time I find on Instagram. 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 My, as de- you, definitely my millennial client. So if they don't come from... You uh, as an individual or your business My Instagram? business, yeah. Okay. So and What do you put on your Instagram? Pretty things. <laughs> and they don't seem like... <laughs> you obviously haven't seen my Instagram. Much. I have not. What, what's what's your handle? Uh, it, yeah, at Little Miss Bookkeeping. So... Okay. What can I tell you about my Instagram for everyone listening? I know, I know you're big on YouTube as well. Like, oh, I want to get YouTube up. I just haven't been able to invest time into that. But I okay. find that a lot of um, millennials... Well, you put up a lot of videos though. Yeah, I, I had I had a good run of like making... like I was trying to do a video like once every fortnight, but that's kind of paused at the moment. It's hard to maintain, isn't it? Like any of that stuff, you're like, oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, now, hands like, down to any YouTuber, that stuff is hard it's hard to find time it's hard to write a script it's hard to edit like it's just it's hard it's yeah yeah it's but hard you, to speak you... in front of a camera like i say i'm um, all the time and i'm probably doing it right now everyone does you just gotta you yeah. just gotta practice and eventually you'll get better so that's what Found i'm doing toast, so like what helped me was toastmasters because like and i haven't done it for ages but i find when i when i was in it because there was a person that actually monitored your arms and hours, like literally there was a person who was called the Amana counter in every single session. And then they would do a report and it was like, Michael used, you know, 22 arms and hours. It's like, oh shit, 22. Yeah. And then next time it's like, you look forward to reducing it, and then you get like that zero thing. 
Um, um, there we go. <laughs> yeah, someone did actually recommend Trace Masters, so I definitely Yeah, wanted... it's really cool. I loved it. And I met so many um, awesome people. Like, a lot of them became really good friends as well. Yeah. Okay, so you've got a lot of pictures and you've got some kind of YouTube videos as well. Reels. Reels. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Very I'm a cool. realer. It, it... I'm not a TikToker. I, I do Reels. Yeah. Not both, which I is know, the, spoke, the same I, thing. They're just like on different platforms, but I'm not going to okay. like grow. I'm surprised you haven't become a TikTok accountant either that, like that. That's like a whole other, I'm on TikTok, but just to stalk and follow. Um, <laughs> but that's like a whole other platform that I would have to commit to. And I'm just not ready to do that. So we just stick to Instagram and Instagram reels for now <laughs> and YouTube. <laughs> Did you have someone helping you with the YouTube stuff? Like you, you wrote a script down. You had like your, your partner there with the camera or. Oh no, like that's, that's on a tripod. <laughs> Okay. My poor video. So I used to edit them all myself and it just took hours and hours and hours. Yeah. So um, what you, we usually have things is I have an idea. It might be a really basic topic. I'll write it, um, some notes down. I'll run through the script. I will just talk to the camera, try, try to keep it as succinct as possible. Mm. Um, you know, if I stuff it up, I start again. And then I essentially. That's the annoying get, part. It is, yeah. yeah. I'll have like an hour footage. I will upload it and send it to my video editor who will kind of like shorten it down and then put in little like fun and quiet things yeah. and make it YouTube ready. So Is that offshore, your video editor, or is it like someone, just a friend that you know? No, she's offshore. Okay. Yeah. And that's what she does and specializes in. Correct, yeah. So she yeah, used okay. to um, live in Melbourne and I found her and her style of video editing I really liked. So yeah. I was like, I need her to do my stuff. So, um, yeah. You have so to I have to give me her details as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then now, like, if you ever do videos now, is it like a, a simple approach? Because I know you do like short videos now. Oh, the reels. Okay. Yeah, the reels. Okay, Actually, we'll call I them reels. Actually, yeah. yesterday. So maybe it might, it will be on Instagram soon, I'm sure. But I'll have an idea in my head. And I, I'll put my camera on a tripod. I will dance or whatever to it. And then I'll write some captions on my notes. I send it to my admin um, assistant. And then she kind of puts it all together in a reel for me. Because I just don't have, like, outsource that because I'm going to be slower than she is. And she's definitely got more creative energy than me. So yep. I, like, come up with a concept, dance in front of the camera or whatever it is. And then she'll stick it together. <laughs> And that's what you get. So all the rules are not done by me. They're done by Taylor. Yep. Um, and you, you've you got about 3,000 followers, etc. And you don't market your Instagram. It just kind of naturally, na- organically grows. Yeah. Yeah. Like we don't okay. run ads. We, we've just okay. been on So you basically kind of organically have grown your client base without going all out. On Google ads or Facebook ads? No, or no, I've never done okay. ads, like paid ads. We've just done a rebrand of a website, post on Instagram. We don't really post much on Facebook because that's not people don't find us on Facebook. So yep. they Google, like they, they use Instagram search, like accountant, and then they find my page. And really, people actually do that. They go on Instagram and they go accountant. Yeah, no, people go on Instagram, type in accountant, and find me. Why? Why would anyone? Go to Instagram. I don't get it. Would it, don't people like Google it instead of going to Instagram? I feel like I don't know. I don't know if this is a millennial thing. I feel like on Instagram, you kind of can because of what's on there. Like you can find videos of the person. So if you go my, into my Instagram, there's me talking to the camera. There's me doing reels. There's pretty posts and information. Yeah. And I think people are really annoyed by like paid ads. Like you Google accountant or you Google bookkeeper, and then like all these. Like pay ads come up and you're like, oh, I don't mm. want to look at that. And then, for example, I don't know about you, but that like accountant websites aren't always really like pretty and fun. So there's a lot of accountants like out there that have amazing websites, like love them. But um, yeah. maybe just the industry in general, it's just not as fun. No, it's very few. There's right. probably two that I can think of that are cool. Yeah. And I think it. people have like you can put more personality into an Instagram or into a TikTok. Yeah. So I feel like if people vibe with me, they're going to contact me and want to work with me. Mm. Like I've closed off all like new clients till the end of the year. And um, my admin, my CSC, 
I've, I've told the team, I said, if anyone wants to work with me, unless I make an exception or for whatever reason, you have to put them on a waiting list for next year. Like, <laughs> we, can't, we have to get everything out before Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good problem to have. So, yes. And do people that come to you, do they already have a bookkeeper or were they doing it themselves before and then kind of just wanted to outsource it? Like, what, what's the typical kind of client? Oh, it's a mix. Like, for example, I had two new client meetings yesterday. One had a bookkeeper, an existing bookkeeper that just they don't want to use them for whatever reason, and then their new accountant referred them to me. So that yep. was kind of like how I've got them and I've bought on board of them now. And the um, the second uh, lead, he had started his business grew really quickly in the last 12 months and just needs help to get that all set up and streamlined and Vassar's done and tax returns. So mm. it was pretty fresh. Okay. But most of them, uh, like it sounds like you, you do rely a lot on accounting referrals. Are they like friends or like people you actually went out to network with? Um, I don't know if I'd rely a lot on them. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how you grew the client, like whether it's through majority of, I don't know whether you've tracked it or not, I guess, through Instagram yeah. or through, you know, referrals or through I reckon, you know, I reckon probably 70% referrals. is Instagram. If, if 70%, I, ask, wow. I ask everyone who comes through my lead yeah. and I'd probably say like 60 or 70% are like, oh, Michelle, I found Instagram. Uh, and the other one is, yeah, a, a industry contact or an existing client. 70% crazy. And most of your clients are across the country, right? They're not even in Sunshine Coast. Yeah. So, I mean, majority of people, I, clients are in Queensland, um, but I've got some clients down New South Wales. Um, I did have some clients over in WA. So, you know, I'm not restricted or nor want to be restricted by location. Um, mm. yeah, sorry. Have you got a, like a sales pitch that you like, you know, you get onto them, there's a lead, like, is there a process you follow whenever you get a new lead? Um, we're building that process out <laughs> where there's like kind of, but not really. Okay. <laughs> Again, focus this one on engineering progress. building systems, but yeah, like yeah. majority, um, of the contact will be Instagram direct message or Facebook message. And then that's when my CSC will contact them pretty much to try and organize my like discovery calls, what people usually yep. call it, or new client um, Zoom. Yep. And then we go from there, either if I can help them, if I can't, if I want to work with them or if I don't want to. And mm-hmm. then um, a proposal will be sent out and then obviously the, the whole sales process of have they signed up, have they not, why not chase up. Okay. How do you figure out whether you want to work with them or not? What, what does they want to work with you and you don't want to work with them? Well, if one says no, then it's no, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's vibing with, with them. So, mm. um, you know, I think because I can see them through Zoom, you can tell if they're kind of like the person you want to work with, if they're like, yes, Michelle, I want to learn with you. I get really excited when people are like, I want to learn how to do my bank rec. I'm like, yes. Like, let's learn together. And then I just have to do best because that's what, like, the bank rec stuff doesn't light me up. But sure, everything else does. So yeah. I get really excited when they get really excited about like accounting stuff. Um, <laughs> Are you doing a course as well? Hey, I said you you you're building a course for them as well. Oh right? yeah, I mean I, I like I'm I have this shiny thing syndrome where I just can't like I have to like keep doing other things. But anyway, a lot of entrepreneurs <laughs> have that. Yeah, it's always a problem. Um yeah, I mean like when you meet someone like you always like you either vibe with them or not. So mm. if you don't, then obviously sorry, we can't help you for whatever reason, or there are particular industries where I just kind of go, like, we don't really work in that industry, and then here's someone who is an expert, you know, go talk to them. So, like, I don't want to be everything to everyone, and I don't want to have a a thousand clients. Like, I don't want to build this, like, massive, massive team. Like, that's that doesn't align with my, like, other goals. What are your other goals? Because was, it was one of my questions towards then. Like, what is your end goal or strategy end, with this? End goal, like business, personal. Everything. Like, everything. what's your end goal? Okay. Um, well, well, start off with the business part. Like, because you said you don't, like, you've made a conscious decision. I don't want to grow it yeah. too big. And, I mean, that could change in, in next year mm-hmm. or the year after. But I COVID, COVID taught me a lot of life lessons around what do I want out of life and what does that look like? Yeah. Um, I want to be able to 
go to Japan and snowboard for a month of the year and, you know, not have to worry about work, um, you know, and not, you know, be able to take four, six weeks off with my partner. I want to be able to take one day a week and take my nephews to swimming lessons and, you know, like, what do they say? Being, having money is rich and being, um, having time is being, is wealthy. Is that right? Is that how you say it? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. And I want more time out of my day. So I want to build a business where I have strong support team. I still do what I love, talking to clients, um, doing sort of like more of the higher end stuff, but still have time to go away. I want, I, like, I want to go sail on a boat, a, a boat for six months with my partner. Yeah. I want to buy a boat. I want to, buy a, I want to go up to the wind some days. Like, yeah. There's certain things in life that I want to tick that bucket list. And I need to build a business that's going to help me achieve those certain things. Yep. And I feel like potentially a massive team is just going to be too much stress for me. Um, I don't need a massive client list to maintain, you know, like, because people think of things in like monetary value. I need to make X or I need to have turnover of X. Hmm. And I'm like, well, I want this. So I only need to make this. So I want this and I only need to have a team of this. Yep. So, you know, we've kind of, I've listed down the goals I want in life, you know, whether it's a dream home or this car yep. and then build the business to get to that. And for me, it's time. It's having time back to be like, if I want to take today off or if I want to schedule a day next week to take, to go jet skiing all day, I can do that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. What's your dream car? Do you really want to know? Yeah. <laughs> Hundred percent. I want to have a G wagon, a white G wagon. A G wagon. A G wagon. What the hell is a G wagon? Google it, Mercedes. G- oh, the G wagon. Yeah, the Merc, of course. Merc. Okay. I was like, I wasn't sure based on like your Instagram whether you're gonna tell me like the yeah. I was thinking G wagon. I was thinking like pink Hummer or something. No, no, it's like a three hundred thousand dollar car. It's totally yeah. ridiculous. This is like when Michelle has like won the lotto and she like doesn't owe anyone anything. And then she just like has cash, like, spare cash. What do you like about it? I never understood that car. Like, I, I know it's, it's, a, I know it's, it's a status gangster. symbol, but it's a box. There's nothing like, it's a box. It's so gangster. <laughs> I don't know. Like I look at like these sports car Ferraris and I'm like, ah, oh. like I don't get it, but then you don't get the do wagon. So no, I'd be like, go Hummer. No. Get the pink Hummer. The G wagon, I love like, it. Like, what's okay. your dream car? Now you have to tell me yours. I feel like I've exposed myself. People are going to judge me. Oh, see, I haven't thought about mine for ages because, like, I mean, if you want like a dream cars, it would probably be Bugatti or something like that, like a Bugatti Veyron. Um, I don't even know what that looks like. Is that like a sports car? Like... It's, it'll be like the Lambo style, but like cooler. Yeah. yeah no, I don't... It looks like a thing that's just going to take off and fly into space. Basically. Yeah, no, that see, that doesn't like, like. That's not my style. The G, that's like, that's gangster, right? Like, I want a gangster car and then people, you know. But again, we're talking dream car. So if that happens or not, whatever. Yeah. Have you learned how to sail yet? Because the thing that you mentioned, like the whole catamaran, that's my dream as well. It's on my bucket list. Ah, well, but I haven't, I do not know how to sail. Oh, I don't right know now. how to sail either. But my partner, he grew up sailing. Okay. Um, and it's just one of those bucket list things where like, let's. Let's one day take, I don't know, three months, six months off yeah. normal life and go to the wet Sundays. Go go north, go south, wherever. I mean, you gotta buy a boat. The boat costs money. The yep. vehicle the business is the vehicle to get money to buy the boat, right? So yep. <laughs> There's an accountant I know in Gold Coast. I haven't had him on a podcast yet, but I want to. Um so he's got a similar kind of thing, like lifestyle business. I think he's got a but he's got more than one director to keep things ticking along while he's on his boat with his yeah. family sailing around the world. Like the yeah. guy literally just sails. Yeah. And I think he's got like a satellite phone so you can hook up that, to his laptop. That is so amazing. He, I love it. So he it. was like, so he, he went sailing, I think just before COVID hit. So he didn't have to do the whole like lockdown things. Of his, mm-hmm. I think he was on a boat. Um, but he had to do all the COVID letters and grants because like the clients were like freaking out. But he would have been like off the coast in Fiji or something on his boat with mm-hmm. his three kids running around, you know. Uh, but he's like, yeah, it was doable, you know, as long as I could get some sort of internet connection somewhere. And I think he probably got a SIM card with data in Fiji and parked himself 50 Ks offshore yeah. and just worked on his laptop doing all that. Oh. But he did have a team and an onshore kind of director as well from memory. Yeah. So it's definitely doable. 
Yeah, I love that. But, I mean, it's kind of like that's the ideal, to be able to not have to, like, if by choice step out of business and, you know, spend Mm. time in life. But then there's also the flip side. Like, imagine if I got hit by a bus tomorrow and in a coma. Like, you still need a team to keep the business running. Yeah. Kind of like either way, processes build business, teams build business. How are you doing the whole process thing? Like, where are you documenting all of that? Um, oh, it's a little bit ad hoc or between us tech stack, but I'm in the middle of building like our intranet, which is like yeah. a whole like learning thing <laughs> <laughs> of which platform I'm going to use and then how I'm going to implement it. So it's always something to do in business. Like it never ends. And that's the problem. You write a to-do list and then you get through it and the to-do list gets longer and then life yes. ends and you forget to live life. So yep. hundred percent. Um, so you've got. I guess three offshore people. Um, when did that start? Was that like a recent thing, the offshoring? Uh, okay, let me think back. So my first offshore um, is my cousin. Love her. Yeah. Melissa, if you're listening, I love you. Don't leave me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when did... My business will crumble if you do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um I went to go visit my family in the Philippines late 2018, 2019. Gosh, I can't even remember. What well, was it before you sold your fitness one? It would have been just, I think it was just before. It must have been 2019. So 2019 then, yeah. Oh, God. Anyway, I went to visit my family um, over there. And then I was listening to a podcast around offshoring. So I called up my, um, another colleague who runs her own firm and I was like, hey, we're going to the Philippines, you come on with me, we're going on a business trip. So I merged a, um, a quick family um, visit with um, a business trip and visited a whole lot of BPOs, went to go visit my family in Cebu, took um, my cousin along to a few of them and, I, and then... Who's um, an accountant. Who is an accountant. But, but an in-house accountant. Correct. So... Yeah. Um, I actually had like I honestly had no plans of like committing to to that whole offshoring thing, but yeah. um, the result was asking her if she liked what she was doing where she was working, and then asking if she wanted to come work for me full time, which was like a massive job for me. It was like it's scary and had never done it. Um, and then the final bit was um, putting her in one of the BPOs, and we visited three in yeah. Cebu. I had it in my head picked one and then I asked her where she would like to go. So she picked that one and I've got her in there. And fast forward to like a year, 18 months later, I onboarded two other full-timers since then. Okay. Yeah. It's through TOA. Correct. Right? What was that like, like getting new people? Obviously, it was a, it's probably easier that you had your cousin there. Correct. I, yeah. I would imagine she could supervise the other two and maintain Well, they haven't. They hadn't met until recently. Ah, so they weren't in the same office? Well, when I onboarded um, my oh, second yeah, two, of COVID. it was just after COVID hit. So yeah, 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 no okay. one was in the office at that time. So, yeah. So, yeah, like we're, we're, we're all kind of separated from each other physically. Um, but, yeah, like I was like, all right, Toa, I'm, I've got the cannon. We don't have to look <laughs> for them. Um, let's start the onboarding process. So that in itself was a lot of learning for me and how like that all works. Then COVID hit and I was like, oh my God, we can't do this like by itself. Why don't I just employ her directly and just work for you? What was the need to go through TOA? I mean, yeah, that's an option. I could start my own BPO and buy No, it just like, at least for your first one, when you start with your cousin, why, why the need for the BPO instead of just going, hey, cool, here's a great, you know, I'll buy you a laptop or if you have one, you know, just start working from your home office. That's scary too. Like I didn't know about like internet security, how to set that up, HR issues, pay, like that's, you know, there's a whole lot of things I have questions about and I'm like, well, there are people who can help support me and yep. other accountants that I can like ask and bounce ideas from mm-hmm. and like I don't need to reinvent the wheel gotcha. if it's already there. It's just simpler. And there's a lot of support that, you know, the relationship I have with a um, you know, a BPO agency that I love about it. So, what do you love about it? Like, what what are the benefits for you? Um, 
simple things as, you know, recommendations around like salary, um, that they can, well, when they were back in the office, facilitate, you know, more of like a, an office culture, mm-hmm. um, help me organize certain things that's going to be too hard for me to organize over there. So, um, cause everyone's working from home, I will be like, Oh, Hey, can do you mind like organizing morning tea for the girls? And they'll logistic, do the logistics of ordering cupcakes yep. and sending it to like everyone's home. And it's just, I don't want to work harder. I want to work smart. And if that yep. comes at a cost, way at the cost, oh, okay, well, it's going to be easier if I do this. It's a no brainer. Yep. So yeah. And I know a lot of accountants who they either directly hire or not, and there's pros and cons to each. And mm. I've decided to go with Toa and okay. yeah. It's been and a you're happy experience. with that? Yeah. Okay. Have there been any challenges or anything that's kind of gone wrong or with the whole um, offshoring thing? No, I, my experience has been completely amazing. I think because I have really amazing, like amazing team. So they're really open with me. Um, we communicate every day, like we do daily huddles every morning. Do you um, do it in Tagalog or do you do it in like uh, in English? Oh, English. Okay. I, I can't, I can't speak. I'm a half, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mama never taught me how to speak. <laughs> Which okay. is, you speak the siren to be on Tagalog, I'm not. But anyway. Um, yes, that's true. Uh, sorry. So, uh... No, I, I, I should do, Tagal- I should do like, they should teach me a new word every day. I knew some words, so like mum will say something. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I've, I've had a really amazing offshore experience. Um, Have you had to train them or were they like pretty... Like they knew their shit and you just had to give them a process to follow. Melissa was in Australia with me for a little while. So um, I onboarded this is your cousin. Her. Correct. Yeah. So I onboarded her and she came to Australia on a three-month visa. Then COVID happened and she ended up staying like 11 months. <laughs> so she was okay. here next to my office and she got the rundown of how everything works and yep. that helped a lot so then she, she would can, train the others her social share knowledge with my with um, my other two i mean yep. um my second hire she had a lot of bookkeeping experience already so um that you know there, it wasn't like you have to train someone from scratch or a graduate from scratch you didn't know anything and then my third hire is um, actually my csc my client service coordinator so she doesn't really do any bookkeeping it's more of the internal admin onboarding so right now I actually got two people that do the bookkeeping. Correct. And you. Correct. Do you actually do any hands-on stuff? Like are you there doing bazaars and bookkeeping and reconciling stuff? And um, The girls will probably do more of that stuff and I'll do like more review type work. Okay. So, yeah. understand. What, I, I guess in your eyes, because you've, you've gone from a senior accountant to a bookkeeper, what differentiates like a great bookkeeper from an average one? Asking questions when they don't know, mm-hmm. as in you don't know what you don't know. You'll you'll meet people who become bookkeepers and they'll do the same thing day in, day out just because they've been trained to do it. Yep. Not, this looks funny, I don't know the answer. Let's actually ask someone who does or find the answer. You're talking about like transactions, particular transactions, oh, like how to code them? Anything, or... like what makes a great bookkeeper? Yeah, asking when they don't know something, you know, asking mm-hmm. like even in my situation, I'll see something that's processed by the accountant and obviously the accountant's made that decision, whatever. Oh, hey, Mr. Tax or Mrs. Tax Agent, um, I've noticed you've processed this this way. How do you want me to do that? Yeah. You know, because like you'll see if I'm doing tax with someone and they and the client does their own bookkeeping or they have an internal bookkeeper process something a different way, Mm. then like it's just going to be a double handle and extra work so that's why it's easier to keep everything in-house i find like like andrew's got his bookkeeping you know practice that has her bookkeeping practice in-house and she finds it's easier to transition to doing the the bazaars the financials and the tax return it's a seamless process definitely yeah Yeah. i I think um you've got to be you definitely have to be upskilling all the time like bloody you know not in regards to just you know technical legislation but you know, zero changes in the way it works and mm. all the other software. Like if you don't know how to process something, like you've got to find that out and not just go, oh, this is too hard, I'm going to leave it or just do it yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah, okay. But in like is bookkeeping just bookkeeping? Like it's a fairly simple process and most people can do it or is, is there like a difference in the outcome? Uh, I mean, I I like to 
if it suits a client, like to show them how to process their own, like really basic stuff, if it, mm-hmm. if it makes sense, where, you know, I get to do more of like the high level review of the VAS, and this is just talking bookkeeping only, um, and maybe streamline some of their systems. Mm-hmm. So it makes, it's like, one, we don't have to do a lot of the grunt work. I mean, there's clients that we do the grunt work for, and that makes sense. But Again, you know, some clients are like, oh, Michelle, I can't pay you to do like end to end. Well, that's fine. Let's do two hours of uh, training. I'm going to do some how-to videos and you can just do that, which is going to take up 90% of that bookkeeping bit and I just do the other 10%. So they do their own stuff, but they watched a couple of videos that you made for them, for example. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. And that's the core. That's why you decided to do the course, basically teaching them how to do yeah. their own thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's clients where I was doing end to end, um, and it got to the point where it's it was work that really I didn't want to do at our charge out or our fee. It was getting more expensive for them because they were growing, and it was. And I went to a client, hey, like I think you need to hire an internal bookkeeper because mm. it just makes sense. Like I would like it if you did. You would, you know, um, get a better yeah, outcome. Cost and it might be they call me once a month going, hey, Michelle, I don't know how to do the transaction, but I left it for you when you do the BAS. Yep. And you've got everyone in zero. You can see what's going on, et cetera. Yeah, yeah 100%. Like, and then do you get your clients on Dex to, as well, like Receive Bank, basically? Yeah, I love, I love Dex. I love Dex. Anywhere I can, I'll be like, we need to use Dex. Like, yep. it, it is. Is that basically, th- that's all you get them to do, zero and Dex? That's, that's what I encourage them to do. Whether they do yep. it or not is another question. Yeah. But for the clients who who really take my opinion on board, yeah, it'll be Dex and, and how much would you charge for like end to end bookkeeping? Just bookkeeping. It depends. Is it a big business? Is it a little business? Like I do yeah. have ideas of packages, but again, you know, is it payroll, is it not? How, do the clients do their own payroll? So there's different kind of things. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then you have it all a practice ignition and just boom. And monthly fee that gets direct debited? basically yeah yeah so yeah. um i was still trying to like streamline some of the direct debit stuff but yeah it'll be um all sort of in there and okay do you find it like i don't know having been an accountant do you find it very menial and boring to do like that kind of sort of basic stuff or is it still interesting i i think i enjoy getting like i enjoy helping new business owners or existing business owners to a level where everything's nice and clean and like cleanup can be a little bit like tedious and whatever Mm. but um you know my my team will probably will assist me in a lot of like the more like tedious work yeah but i i want to get i like to get clients to a point where they understand the numbers better they can pull reports out of zero and use that to make informed business decisions and kind of like I want to educate them so they can kind of like steer their own ship. Okay. You know, I don't want to be one of those accounts who are like, oh, if we're going to take you on, we're going to do everything, anything, and this is a set fee and that's it. Like mm. I want to do. Isn't that like taking business away from you, you know? This way you can maximize it. Hey, by the way, I'm going to. Yeah. Well, I could, but it's like there's certain things that I like to do and certain things I don't. So, okay. so it's um, that again, way. depending on the client, you know, if they can do pay, if they can do their weekly payroll and, um, and it makes sense for them too because they're like recording timesheets or whatever. I'll train them to do that. And if you're yeah. good at it, it'll make it clean. I'll do, I don't know, quarterly super, payroll rec, and my job's easy and that's done. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. What do you struggle with day to day? A million emails. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you have a client services officer that kind of... Well, I'm still kind of... I've still got a, a lot of the emails coming directly to me or, you know, through my triage. So, um, yeah, I think until I streamline a few of my systems and educate my clients who they need to speak to or whatever, I'm still quite hands-on in, like, client communication and following that through, through to the team. Okay. Yeah. So that's the biggest struggle. Yeah. I'd say. Do you have a structure that you follow? Like, do you know, like, hey, I wake up at this time and I do A, B, and C, and then I go to the beach and then I kind of do my emails at that time um, oh, yeah there? yeah it'll be like get up go to the gym um you know I'll, I'll i'll try and do a normal like you know 8 8 30 to kind of 6 roll where we do nine o'clock daily huddle um so you do one every single day 
just to like for the culture or like as a workflow thing? Oh, both, you know, I wake up and get on Zoom and show everyone Bruce, who's my French bulldog, <laughs> check it on everyone. And then, yeah, just quickly go, what's everyone working on today? And tell them what I'm doing so they know if I'm contactable or not. Yeah. Um, and how long would that go for? Um, Anywhere from 10 minutes to half an hour. Okay. So it's nice and quick. And do you do one at the end of each day as well? Or is it uh, just in the morning just to be like, all right, guys, this came in yesterday. You know, yeah. we need to get this done by 5 p.m. today because I need to send out the, the client email. Or it's just making sure that one, they're accountable, and two, they keep me accountable because sometimes, like, Michelle, you didn't send that email. I'm like, I didn't yeah. I send it after this meeting. <laughs> or I'll forget about it. There's so much going on that. There's always, yeah, it's, 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 you're human. Yeah, you yes. just, unless you have like an incredible system. You know, I live off my calendar and unless it's in my calendar, I just don't remember how. Oh, 100%. That's me. Yeah. I, I don't even look at my calendar. It's like crazy, like color-coded and like, yeah. it says gym. It says like meeting. It's, it's all color-coded. It's, yeah. Um. So what's your end goal with the business? Like, I know obviously you, you probably have a similar philosophy to me, which is like, you know, life is about experience and it's meant to be lived kind of thing. It's not all about having the biggest business or the most amount of money. Like it's a good, striking a good balance between, hey, like this is a, a really good amount of money, especially for where I live, mm-hmm. uh, what I can do with it. And that's kind of enough. Like I don't need to be the biggest of the richest. But what's your end goal? Like, is there one with the business? You know, how big you want it to be and anything? Oh, I mean, I think I don't want, again, I don't want to have, you know, hundreds and thousands of clients. I would rather sort of grow the existing clients I have, like grow with them and their fees, you know, people talk about average um, fee per client. So yep. in my head, I kind of know what I want to have out of my client base. Yeah, like I don't, what do I want? I want to be able to go sit on the beach one day a week and be able to take time off. So like people talk about turnover and yeah, that's a good metric to have. But yeah, it's what <laughs> what the, the cost after that is either going to be big or little you know as accountants we see million dollar businesses running at losses every single year and mm. it kind of like I, i'm always interested when people are like oh i make like seven figures blah 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 I'm like that's great but i would rather make like a quarter of that and be on like a better wage or have more free time than yeah. like a seven figure business so i think for this for see like i have at least for the next a five-year plan to kind of like Keep going, get everything streamlined. Do you have a five-year plan? In my head, in my head. Like okay. I have a plan, like personal goals, you know, dream home, all that type of thing. Yep. And, you know, the business is a vehicle to get to the dream home, to get the house deposit, yep. all that. So, um, yeah, I think it's just kind of like growing, upskilling the team so we can do, we could all learn and do like more more work, other work. Um, How do you stay up? Like, how do you upskill yourself? Because, like, you know, it's it's easier when you're working at a place like video where there's constantly, you know, training and external trainers and partners are going to conferences and they bring their knowledge back. How do you do it for yourself? Um, so I every year we do um, tax school by NTAA. So I do that with a colleague. We that's like we do the, the thing. tax yep. updates. So we definitely do that. Um, I'm always doing or trying to do, um, the change GPS guy stuff. Like I yep. love their like webinars that they do, um, pretty regularly. I'm signed up to a whole lot of other like knowledge base and all that. So I'll, I'll always get the emails and I'll always sign up for the stuff that interests me. Like I think I did a crypto tax one the other day by, mm. uh, that was presented by like knowledge shop, sorry, knowledge shop, knowledge base, I can't remember. Knowledge um, shop. yeah. So like I love learning and I'll, I'll always like pick webinars and, and pay yeah. for them if it interests me. And I probably like, I can't even, I have to go back and see how many hours I've done on CPD. I've done like a lot, especially over COVID. Like you have to sign this webinar. So you're like, what the hell is JobKeeper? So you yeah. like, watch the webinar and you talk to other accountants. And, you know, I think I just signed up for um, Joyce Ong's um, Academy. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm like, I'm loving her like, vibe and um she's she seems very cool i gotta get her as a guest as well yeah one day so, yeah I, um, I would have thought that the whole cpd would be hard but i i naturally 
want to learn more. Yeah. So and I'll you kind of have to yeah. for the sake of your clients. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Like something would change. I'm like, I don't know. I didn't know yeah. that. And you'll talk to other, like, probably I caught up with some um, accountants who are who went commercial and it's interesting just to see how different our jobs are and yeah mm. do you um do you find like your level of skills and experience would be like for example uh, a partner you know the guys you used to work for in your previous firms would it be at a similar level or different level like having the experience that you have now in relation to like accounting you know being a practitioner I don't know, like they definitely have more technical skills and experience, but I think my knowledge lies in certain other areas. So, for example, if there's something I don't know, I can reach out to my, you know, colleague who's been, you know, she's yeah. got way more experience than me. And she's like, oh, Michelle, you just like that's this legislation. Going to- so you have a, a network basically yeah. that you can reach out to. Uh, the, the reason I'm asking is like, I'm curious whether what's too early to leave and go out on your own kind of thing. Like what's the minimum number of years you need to do in a practice where you're like, you know what? I'm pretty competent. I've pretty much learned as much as I could learn. Yeah. Uh, or 95% and the rest I'll kind of figure out as well. But I've got the skills that I need to have to be able to do my job as a practitioner. Yeah. Um, what's that? Is it like, is it three years? Is it five years? Like what would you say that is? I, 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 in my opinion, I think you need to be a senior accountant that has been doing that for at least five years to be exposed enough to. So five years life, as a senior accountant or five years in total? Well, I think in five years you probably would have gotten to the senior account level. Yeah, and so that's I, enough time? Well, I think it depends on what you do. You could be, I don't know, a just do a super and like – True. That, you know what yeah, I mean? Really, like, yeah, yeah. But just I, like a typical business services tax person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think three years is probably too small. You probably don't, again, depending on what work you're doing, you could be exposed to a lot of stuff in three years. But yeah. I was doing, for the first two, a lot of I returns and really basic yes, business all the stuff. basic stuff. And yeah. then, you know, as you grow, you're, you're, you get assigned more complex and complex stuff. So mm. it was sort of like that seven-year mark that, you know, I left and – that was that was me but i still have a lot of learning to do which is why i still would ask the questions to some people and mm-hmm. it comes in both ways i've got people come to me like oh do you like talking about tech stacks and shopify and how does my client get like be like reports out of them like oh click this this and this yeah and like oh I'm like, yeah <laughs> <laughs> did a webinar um okay cool what's had the biggest impact on you in your life the biggest impact um, I don't know. Book, person, mentor? I don't know. I think the whole, like, leaving my job, like, my firm was probably, like, one of the most significant times in my life yeah. where it was bloody scary. It was, like, I had to jump. And I'm so glad I did because I could never go back to working for someone else. I'm too much an entrepreneur now. Like, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, you, it's you just, really you know, hard. You... you, you you build your life around you. You make the choices. You know, you're not confined to someone dictating your yeah. nine to five, which is fine. Like, obviously, like <laughs> that's what my girls do. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, just kind of like jumping, even though I was so terrified. Is like, Why were you terrified? Well, I'm a risk averse person. So, and I, and like my, the way I view things now is so different to how I viewed things back then. Because I'm like, oh, what if it doesn't work out? Like, what if I can't get another job? But then the way I do things is, well, let's have a crack, worst case scenario, and back to where I am now. Yeah. Like if I went out or it didn't happen and I have to go back to working at my old job. You'd get a job pretty quickly. That, that welcome me back in open arms and I'll go yeah. back to where I was. Like yeah. I'm not going to go backwards. <laughs> Did you have a lot of conversations like friends and family and stuff like that before you took the plunge or? Um. Yeah, I, I think I definitely would have, you know, hash it because it was it was probably like a six month decision over six month decision wow okay so yeah. it wasn't overnight. like it wasn't like i'm not i'm not just gonna go up to my boss and be like i don't know about this i don't know about this i'm like no like I, I need to i mean I, I did mention that the i kind of made the decision in that meeting about going from four days to three but in my mind i knew that i kind of had to do a, mm. take the leap at some point so yeah. that i think that pushed me to do that did your parents like encourage you or 
to do it or like do they discourage you and you know you can't you can't tell you you can't tell your filipino mother that you're quitting your full-time job (laughs) oh my goodness no (laughs) that's what i was curious about yeah (laughs) so you didn't tell her (laughs) (laughs) so when did you find out was it like does she actually know that you're running your own thing now oh yeah or does she still think like you go to video every day (laughs) so um (laughs) No, I just, I think, I can't remember exactly when I told her, but I was like, oh, yeah, mom, I quit my old job, oh, and I'm running the e-commerce full-time, oh, and I'm still an accountant because I'm bookkeeping, so that's kind of like that pat, like that softens yeah. the blow, the whole, like, I'm still okay. accounting. Like, How did she like, react then? So she's like, oh, okay. So she was okay with it. <laughs> All right, let's do some rapid-fire questions and wrap up. What's your favorite quote? Um... Oh, I think we spoke about this the other day. You can never cross the ocean if you don't have courage to lose sight of the shore. Okay. I don't. I, can't, I, don't, I, I can't remember the. the I was like, I, I haven't. I know. I know where it's going, but yeah, I can't remember reading that one. So it's a new one yeah. for me. But makes so, sense. I remember posting on social media when I quit the day, I, the last day of my ABDO job. Like that was that was my. That was the quote. That was the quote, that, and it stuck with me. Like you have to leap. Yeah. And you have to not be scared to leap. So mm. that's kind of like how I do life now. What have you read, watched, or learned recently that's had the most impact on you? Um... Or a favorite book that you absolutely love that that's the one you recommend? Or... I, the one that actually, um, when I was in the middle of transitioning, I picked up a book called, I think it's behind me, the, oh, I have to read it. The Secrets of Online Entrepreneurs. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so it's not like a really widely popular book, but I think I picked it up at a secondhand bookshop and I was like, oh, this is a cool read, and I read it. And it was, it's got a lot of quotes and stories about other entrepreneurs sort of taking the lead. And I yep. read it and I was like, I've got to do it. And that also probably pushed me. I read it at the right time in my life. Like if you if you read it and you don't have an online business, then you're probably not, to, mm. it's not going to really impact you. But I picked it up at the right time, and that was probably like very influ- like we were very influential to me. The universe aligned. Yeah. Okay. What's something that most people don't know about you? <gasps> I don't know. That's interesting. Hmm. I don't have a twin brother. <laughs> ah. That's kind so of like, like a fun fact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. Last question: Who would you want to have a drink with? the most in the world past the present oh i can't answer that one there's so many people i feel like i'll be judged if i say someone silly i no, i would say no, no. past or present who i don't want to have a drink if it was like a group of people or someone it would probably have to be someone like a very prominent business leader owner where i can just pick their brains give me the name give me the silly oh, name no. that you have in your head that you're too embarrassed no. to say. um someone like i don't know simon sinek Elon Musk, someone like who's very influential, even maybe a little bit crazy, to sit down and like see how they vibe and see what like makes them tick like face to face. What and would you ask, ask the most random questions? Like, why What's do you want to go to space, Elon? Like, <laughs> like meet me to you. I'm not going to tell anyone, but <laughs> yeah, like I probably wouldn't have dinner with him, but you get the idea. Like someone yeah, yeah, yeah. influential and yeah. okay, he'll probably be like, well, the planet is dying. <laughs> Yeah. Just in case, hedging my pet. Yeah, I I think I'd like to have dinner with someone who can give me, like, if you could do it all again, how would you do it differently? Like, what are the business learnings? Someone I can, you know, who's built a big business and I can go back. I know Jane Lou, I I spy, I look up to Jane Lou. She's the um, uh, the owner of Shopo. Yes. She's yeah. fun. I used to party with her back in the day. Oh, really? Jealous. Yeah. <laughs> she's a, because she's a friend of uh, one of my good friends. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have, like, I, haven't seen her since back when we were both accountants or auditors. This is yes, a yes. Time she's, ago. Yes, she's actually, yeah, it's yeah, really cool. She's so. another kind of accountant um, that went into a very different direction. Correct, yes. And done really well for herself. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. No problem. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like our podcast and share it on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, wherever it is you hang out so more people can benefit from these speakers. 
Also, please subscribe on our website so you get all of our latest episodes. And if there's anything else I can help you with or you have speakers you'd love to hear from or some feedback about the current episode, please feel free to send an email to michael at recruitmentexpert.com.au. Until then, take care and I look forward to connecting with you in the future.